So uh, I have a confession to make. I have a horrible memory. I can barely remember the names of my three kids. My son Jesse responds to our dog's name, Bodie, and at this point, Bodie responds to Jesse. But I can remember the names of every one of the 18 kids I taught in New York City in 1987. You see, those kids had the odds stacked against them. 50% of them wouldn't make it from their freshman year to their senior year, and, and very few beyond that would uh, go on to college. One of those kids in particular haunts me to this day. His name was Jody. Now, Jody was a good-looking kid, a nice kid in a lot of ways, but he was also a drug dealer. On the last day of school, I pulled Jody aside and I said, I love you, man, but you're going to be dead or in jail if you don't change your path. Jody just smiled and walked away. You see, Jody and those kids in New York, they set me on my own path. They forced me to wrestle with some questions, like what I, was I even making a difference teaching? Were these kids on a conveyor belt to poverty? Was this system possible to change, or was it too entrenched? If other countries were passing us by, what were they doing that we were not, and could we adapt? It pushed me to go on to graduate school in public policy. I actually had an opportunity to go visit some of the high-performing countries like Singapore, Shanghai, and Finland. And I'm very much still learning, but here's a little bit about what I know. Why is it so hard to change? Well, any system that's been around for a while is going to be hard to change. Our public education system has been established for 180 years. So the grooves are deep. The politics and the power structures are deeply entrenched and interlocked. This is especially hard because this is an American system of public education. You see, remember that we were escaping King George, a despotic king. So local control is incredibly important. So we have an inherently difficult system to change that by design has diffuse control over it. Now, the US had one of the best education systems in the world up through the 1960s. And as we started to lose a little bit of ground, we responded, we're competitive. And I'd say there were two big strategies we tried. The first is the, the federal strategy. In 1965, Johnson established the Elementary and Secondary Education Act. Under Bush, it was called No Child Left Behind. Under Obama, Race to the Top. And I would argue that those things actually did a lot of good. They forced us to raise standards, invest in early childhood, but they had limits. So take a state like Delaware, where a lot of money goes into public education, about a third of our budget goes to public education. Only seven cents on the dollar comes from the federal government. So there's limited leverage there. And remember that DNA of local control? Anything coming from Washington is inherently going to be thought of with some skepticism. The second strategy we tried, and we're still trying, is what I would call a foundation strategy. And by the way, these big foundations like Gates and Annenberg don't exist in other high-performing countries. But around the 80s, there was major investments in our big cities, in New York, in Chicago, Los Angeles. And those, those investments, again, I think produced some great innovations, some new ways to think about designing schools, train teachers and leaders. But there are limits to that strategy, because we want to have a coherent national strategy that moves quickly. And we have 14,000 districts in this country. So a lot of people think that Delaware has too many with 19. Across the border in New Jersey or Pennsylvania, there are hundreds. And so investing deeply in a few big cities is probably not the best and only way to get to a coherent, rapid strategy. I'd argue that there's a third strategy what I would call a state strategy. And I'd say that it has equal doses of help, heat, and hope. And I'll try and unpack that for you a little bit. So help. One of the first things we do as a nonprofit foundation is get people together. You see that the public sector, they're busy educating kids every day. And the, and the private sector, 
they're running businesses. As a nonprofit, we can bring people together to wrestle with a common vision. And that's important. It's foundational. But just recirculating our current ideas has limits. So we try and bring the best thinkers from around the country and around the world to inform our thinking. We actually created uh, an international advisory group that includes some of the best thinkers from Singapore to Switzerland. And let me give you a little sense of some of the things we're learning uh, in that process. The first is somewhat obvious, that people matter. We know that technology is going to transform our, our lives outside of school and in it. But the highest performing systems, they've realized that no system can outpace the quality of its people. So what we've learned from places like Finland is that you have to be tough about who becomes a teacher. You have to invest in them. You have to create a career path so that our best teachers don't have to leave the classroom to become a principal or, or an administrator in order to take care of their family. Another thing we learned is that if you want to design to the future, you need to map back from it. So in Canada and Singapore, what they engaged in was conversations around what a well-educated citizen might need to know and be able to do in 2025. That's a little difficult to think about. The world is changing so quickly. But one of the things, just to give you an example, is that we know that memorization of information is probably going to be less important than the utilization of it. Be able to use information, because we have information coming from us and at us uh, a thousand times a second. So if you think about that, just one example, how does that inform how we teach our kids, how we train our teachers, how we assess what success looks like? We actually engaged in that process here in Delaware, and we're in the middle of that process, and it's called Ed 25. Education in Delaware in 2025, and I invite any of you to engage in that. There's actually some conversations going on as we speak. But help is incredibly important. Getting people together, thinking about new ideas, foundational. But as I said, this is a really tough problem to solve. So you need some heat. And I'll try and provide some color on what that might look like. In 2005, we got a group of those public and private players together. And we had a great facilitator, an expert in leadership by the name of Marty Linsky, who was a savvy New Yorker, facilitating a conversation with us. It was our first meeting. And he asked us a softball question, which was, why are you here? And all of us gave our flowery answers that we wanted to see all kids learn. And he, Marty, patiently listened to all of us. And then he said, you're all full of crap. He said, none of you are really exercising the leadership necessary to get to that higher goal. He turned to the business leader and he said, are you really willing to go back to your colleagues and say we need to raise taxes in order to invest more deeply to get the goals, reach the goals you want to? And he went to the union leader and said, are you really willing to talk to your members about accepting more accountability to engender that deeper investment? All of us shifted in our seats a bit. In fact, some of us actually cried because we were caught in our own hypocrisy. We were privately acting in a way that was inconsistent with our public acts. Now, heat is important, and it's not a new idea. Martin Luther King called it creative tension. And his basic idea was that if things are going great, keep going. But if they're not, you need to introduce creative tension because it forces important new conversations. And I would argue that this is the most important public debate we should be having. We should be fighting. We should be arguing about this because it's important. This is a full contact sport. And it takes focus and grit to move us forward. So that's a little bit of heat. But this is, this is tough work. And so hope is important as well. And I have hope in my bones. Like many of you, my father's family came here with nothing. In his case, Puerto Rico to New York City. Through the GI Bill, he was able to go to college. And that one act changed not only his life, but all of us that followed him. My three kids, from day one, they know they're going to college. 
I have hope in this state, in this system of public schools. You see, over the last 10 years I've been here, even in the last few, there are more kids getting high quality early care than they ever have. There are more kids taking college level courses than they ever have. There are more kids going to college than they ever have. And our, our dropout rates and our graduation rates are the best they've been in 30 years. Now, I, I don't want to overpaint this because our achievement gaps are real and our overall numbers aren't nearly where they need to be, but we are moving as a system. I also have hope because of those kids in New York. A couple of years ago, I was fortunate enough to go back to a reunion of that, that program. It was called New York City Outward Bound. It was at a fancy hotel, the Plaza Hotel in New York. And one of the keynote speakers was one of my students. His name was Chris. Now, Chris had come to that neighborhood with nothing, and he was going to be staying with relatives who had very little. He was living in the same neighborhood I was living in, which had the highest crime rate in New York City, Washington Heights. And he was going to be attending that high school that I talked about. So in his, his comments, he said, I thought by the time I was 18, I was going to be homeless. Now, the good news is he wasn't homeless. He not only finished high school, he finished college. He's married, has a couple of kids. He's now an art director at the Wall Street Journal. The better news is that he wasn't alone. That group of 18 grew to 150. We created a school within a school that was built on leadership and service. And 90% of those kids in that school were 50%, weren't even making it to their senior year, were going on to college. Chris and I had a chance to go out for a beer. You see, now he was in his 40s, I was nearly 50. We went to an Upper East Side bar. We were watching a basketball game. It was the NBA playoffs. And we were reminiscing about that group of 18, that first 18. And it was great that Alex had come back from Iraq unscathed, that Edwin, who we knew loved art when he was in high school, actually was now an art teacher. We went through all of them. We got to the last one, which frankly, I was hoping halfway that he didn't know the answer to my question, which was, so what happened to Jody? Without averting his eyes from the game, he said, he's a cop. I said, he's a cop. I practically spit my beer across the counter. <laughs> he said, you know, he works at night. You know, why don't you give him a call? And before I could even respond, Chris hit speed dial on his phone, and he, he gave me the phone. I went outside because the bar was kind of loud. And I started to uh, listen to the phone ring. Jody picked it up, speaking in Spanish because he thought it was Chris. And I tried to explain who I was. And before I could even answer fully, he said, Mr. Herdman, this is crazy. I felt the weight of 25 years of not knowing whether he was alive or dead melt from my shoulders. You see, I believe that education can change the trajectory of individuals' lives. And I believe that systems can change. But I believe it requires that mix of hope, help, and heat. You see, heat without some hope and help just burns. And hope and help without a bit of that heat has the real potential to just perpetuate what is. But I believe that together, imagination can overcome inertia, and that determination can overcome our divisions, and that love can overcome fear. You see, I look at this challenge as not a condition that we need to accept. I look at it as a problem that we can address. When I think back to my father's generation, and I think about how they not only changed this country, but this world, and then I look at the challenge of our schools, and I, th I see that as not only a, an opportunity, but a responsibility of our generation. And I believe 
that if you join us in this challenge, that our children and this country will be the better for it. Thank you.